kind of endlessly romantic, at least for me. Um, this is typically Point Lighthouse. It's been a while. Yeah. Pull it. <laughs> it's like putting those puzzles together, you know, one spot for all of them. Okay. And, uh, <coughs> all right. Uh, that's it. Yay, yeah. John. Yeah. You had it. Perfect, and then it kind of rose back up again. Oh, I better leave it alone. Fine. Okay. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Thank you. All right. Yeah. It's hard to see the painting. Well, he hasn't painted anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> what he says. Yeah. It's just white paper. Hopefully, with a painting underneath, it, it speaks a little louder. Is that? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. We'll get there. Promise. Um, so this is Pimaquit Point Lighthouse in Maine, along the coast of Maine. It's a um, popular tourist destination. We have visited visit there. It's lovely. It's a wonderful lighthouse. And the um, Lake Keeper's House has dramatic rocks leading down to the ocean. It's just a, one of those magical locations. Um, what are you going to use as a source of reference? Well, it turns out I'm going to use this photograph right here, um, which is not exactly like that painting, which I like. I don't like the idea of copying a photograph. I like to use the photograph as inspiration for a painting, kind of what gets me up off the sofa and gets me into the studio and gets some, my creative juices um, moving. Um, and I don't try to copy the photograph in terms of even um, relationships of size and perspective and all of those things. And what I want to try and do here is make a successful painting. And a successful painting or work of art is mostly and most often different from um, a photograph. The last thing I want to do is copy a photograph. It becomes a very, what Ed Whitney called, tick-tock type of experience, where tick, I look at the photograph, tock, I paint it. Tick, tock, tick, tock, which is boring, for lack of a better word. Um, if, you, if you're a painter, Part of the joy of painting is being able to take any subject, whether it's live subject or a photograph, and transform it into something that is meaningful to you and reflects uh, not only your creative nature, but your understanding and knowledge of composition and design. You can take that photograph or whatever it is you're looking at, eliminate things, then eliminate some more things, then eliminate some more things, and move some things around. Great artists are great eliminators. I think it was Frank Webb who said that, at least the first time I heard it. And that is the truth. We rarely put more stuff into whatever it is we're trying to paint. Um, we want to eliminate things and reduce whatever we're intending to paint to only the most important shapes and values. Speaking of which, I think the last time I was here, I went into a, a fairly long discussion about the elements and principles of design and all the complexity that goes into um, a great work of art. It is the most important aspect of two-dimensional representational art that I think exists. Um, but I won't go into that again. 
I also do plein air painting. I paint outside, and when I do that, I don't have time to sit down and go through seven um, elements, seven principles, and the 49 resulting aspects of design that are incorporated into the perfect painting, which, by the way, does not exist. But the more of that that I am able to think about and plan for and incorporate into my painting, the better off my painting will be. It will raise the artistic standard, raise the painterly nature of my work. Um, and that's always what I'm after. So thinking about, I've boiled down those 49 elements into what I think are the four most important aspects of any painting. Um, and these are the four things that, to me at least, sound really simple, almost to the point of childish, but they are the most important um, components of a successful painting. And I think they take a lifetime of painting to really gain um, an appropriate or deep understanding of. I love this um, quote, which someone attributed to Manet, the famous impressionist painter. I'm sure it's not true, but I love it anyhow. That on his deathbed, his final words were, I was just beginning to get it. <laughs> I love that. You, ne you never get there. You never arrive at the top of the mountain. You never are the artist you want to be. There's always more to learn and understand and try and experience. But understanding, seriously understanding composition and design will make us the best artists that we can be. So what I'd like to do today is something a little different, um, which is to take this Pimiquid Point lighthouse and use a vignette format to try and capture it. If you're familiar with the vignette format, um, you already know how powerful it is. If it's something that you're either not familiar with or have never tried, try it. Because you can take any subject matter, maybe your favorite subject matter, whatever it might be that you've painted 50 times before and you always love it, and you can paint it 51 times because you can do it in the vignette format. Nick, let's just move the table back towards you just a little bit so we can more of a, a little more keep going, keep going. Good. All right. really good. And I'll zoom in whenever you want. Okay. The academic definition of a vignette format um, is to leave four areas of unpainted white paper in the four corners of our painting, each a different size and a different shape and then to run the painting off on each of the four sides of the painting at a different location and a different width. That's a lot yeah. to figure out. It's really not that complicated. We want to try and leave as much unpainted white space as we can on our paper. I can't tell you how many times I've done vignette paintings and someone will say, it's a lot of white that you painted. What did you use, gouache or Chinese white? Or It's important for any painting that we try and save some amount of white paper coming through. It gives the painting a chance to breathe. It allows for um, areas of the painting that might otherwise be boring to have life in them. Don't ever take it upon yourself to cover up all of your white space. Leave white in your paintings. Gives your paintings a chance to breathe and um, makes them more vibrant, more entertaining, more exciting, more interesting. So I think I actually did bring along, not intentionally mind you, but I think I did bring along one vignette. Um, I'll just use it as a quick reference. If you're doing the vignettes, still tape the edges? I do, yes. The question was, if you do a vignette, do you tape down the edges of the paper? Is that what you mean? Yes, I do. Um, I don't know if you can see that. It's a, it's a barnscape. Vignette. Four areas of unpainted white paper in the four corners of the painting, each a different size and a different shape painting running off of the page on each of the four sides at a different location and a different width. I think I've got it pretty close to exactly right here. Um, of course, once you understand the rules, you can bend them. 
and sometimes even break them, but understand them first. It's a powerful way to paint. The white of the paper in watercolor is dramatic, especially when it's um, contrasted with a very dark, rich passage, or a rough texture passage, or a shape that I guess is some sort of a shed or something, but doesn't have the sides or the other angle on the roof. That's, to me, what I like to call painterly painting. So that's an example of a vignette. And I thought that that would be an interesting way for us to approach the lighthouse today. So I've had a chance to think about it. And um, one of the things I'd like to do is um, decide where the sunlight is coming from. And I'm going to decide it's coming from this side. Why? Because that's my decision to make. I'm the painter. I make that choice. I need to think about those things and make sure that I um, <coughs> work on the painting in a way that it helps me tell that story. Oh, I, I think I cut up myself off. I got distracted somehow. It was John. He did it to me with the move the table. I have a way with that. Damn you, John. No, I'm kidding. So I said I boil down all those different aspects of composition and design into um, four primary um, focus areas, which I always think about when doing a painting. One is um, shapes. Shapes are so critically important. We all think about, what am I painting? I'm going to paint a lighthouse. That's my subject. As soon as I decide that I'm going to paint a lighthouse, I immediately try and transition my thinking to, OK, now think about what the shapes are going to be in my painting. I want to make sure this shape is different from this shape, which is different from this shape, this shape, this shape. Even the shapes of these rocks down here, all of those shapes should be different. Sounds easy when I say that. It's not easy how often and how surprising it is to me that I will make two shapes that are exactly the same. And it's boring. It may not be obvious to the viewer, but somewhere deep in our psyche, if we look at a painting that has boring shapes, we're bored by it. So we want to think about interesting, engaging shapes. I was looking at the sketch I did in preparation for today's demo and thinking about shapes. I thought, well, look at that. The distance that that lighthouse is from this left edge of the paper is the same as the width of the lighthouse. Look at that, I did it. Proving yet again what a human being I am, what a deep, rich, flawed human being I am. So that's bad shape making. That is bad shape making. So then I thought, how can I resolve that without erasing and resketching the whole thing? And I had a genius of a moment. It's genius. It's not only a way to eliminate that bad shape making, it's a way to really kick up the painterly nature of this painting. Notice I grabbed my eraser. <laughs> what if I just decide that this edge doesn't exist? Take that edge away and let the side of the lighthouse be defined by the trees down here that will butt up against it and will tell me about this part of the lighthouse and then the light um, up above and just let all of that be part of the sky. One shape. Now all of a sudden that's a much better shape than it was. I didn't have to do anything except to race for 10 seconds. It's genius. <laughs> so we'll do that. That's painterly stuff. The viewer will know that this is the side of the lighthouse by virtue of the light on top and by virtue of these trees that will butt up against it. And we'll let the sky and the lighthouse be one shape. Mm, so happy. I continued to look at it. I did this sketch yesterday. And I said, well, look at that. I sketched loosely these trees that'll come up against the lighthouse. They are at the same place that the roof line of this lightkeeper's house takes off. It's also bad shape making, really bad. So I need to either bring that down lower, much more um, 
painterly or bring it up a little higher. <clears throat> I'll just, I'll remember to do that. And if I don't, someone here will remind me, right? Don't forget. So boy, composition and design, shape making is, sounds really easy, it's not, and it's so critically important to the success of our work. Okay, now I think I'm in better shape. So shapes are important, think about shapes. I've decided I'm gonna paint whatever it is, a barn, a boat, a mountain, um, a lighthouse, it doesn't matter. Once I've made that decision, immediately begin to think about shapes, both the positive shapes of the lighthouse and the lightkeeper's house and the rocks and the negative shapes that it creates around those things. Interesting shapes. Second is value, the relative lightness or darkness of whatever it is we're painting. <clears throat> I want to have a value story that um, is compelling. My darkest darks should butt up against my lightest lights. So the top of that lighthouse should be pretty dark in value. The cast shadow, since I said the sunlight's coming from this direction, the cast shadow across that lighthouse should be fairly dark. The trees that come up and butt up against the lighthouse should be dark. The lightkeeper's house should at least have some dark in it. That should help direct my viewer's eye to where I want them to look. I don't want the viewer to be confused at all, thinking, well, maybe it's this that I should be looking at, or maybe it's these rocks and whatever's going on down here. I want it to be clear as it can be that this is where you should be looking. The star of the show is the lighthouse. It's the biggest shape, which helps, but put value contrast in there also to help drive that home. And that should apply to any of the paintings that I have <clears throat> over here, any of the paintings. Don't prove yourself wrong now. Don't make a mistake. This is a painting about a waterfall. Lots and lots of other stuff going on, but it's a painting about a waterfall. So I put the darkest darks around the waterfall. So when you first look at this painting, your eye should go right there. Then you can wander around and enjoy the trees and the sky and the distant mountain and all this other happy stuff going on. But your eye should go right there, telling the viewer this is a painting about a waterfall. Same thing is true here, another landscape. Majestic mountains and, and all sorts of wonderful trees and things in this water here, movement in the water. But everything's telling me by virtue of not only the lines, but the fact that it's the darkest in the painting right here, right around our fly fisherman. He's the center of interest. That's where I went, want the eye to go first, and then it can wander from there to other things around the page. Does that make sense? Yes. You're all professional painters, you know this. <laughs> We make mistakes. <laughs> we all make mistakes all the time. Okay, so shapes, values, and edges. Um, a variety of edges in our paintings. I can't plan for edges when I'm planning a painting. can only really apply um, the idea of a variety of edges in my painting once I start painting. So when I'm painting, I'm always thinking about edges. If I've gone an inch or two in my painting without changing the edge, if I'm painting a hard edge, changing it and having a soft edge, <clears throat> adding some rough texture or dry brush texture edge. In any workshop that I do, and since we just got back from leading a workshop, I always do this quick five minute demo here, which is, these are hard edges. I sprayed some water on it, got some soft edge. This is also known as lost and found. Driving along, everything feels good, it's comfortable, I know right where I'm going. Uh-oh, what happened? I'm lost, I'm frightened, Danny M. Oh, there I am. Keep going. Hard edges, soft edges, and then rough texture or dry brush texture marks, which is just making a faster brush stroke so that you're depositing pigment only on the grain of the paper 
and it does not go down into the valleys of the paper. They're the only edge types that we have at our disposal. There's not a fourth one or a fifth one. We have three edge types, so put some of each in every painting that you do. It helps to make your painting sing, makes it exciting, makes it visually entertaining for our viewer. So shapes, values, edges, and then of course, color. Most paintings that I do don't have any more than three or four or five colors, and yet, like most painters, I have 24 pigments in my palette. It's ridiculous. I've known since third grade that we only have yellow, red, blue, maybe black, and white. That's it. Don't ever tell Daniel Smith I said that, <laughs> or Windsor Newton, or Holbein, because they have hundreds, and they want you to buy every single one. But the reality is there's only three, maybe five. Maybe you can double that. You can say, okay, there's blue, but there's a blue that leans toward yellow. It's gonna make greens more quickly. <coughs> there's a blue that leans toward red, and it's gonna make purples more quickly. And the same applies to yellow and red. Um, but that's about it. Keep it simple. Boy, keep it simple. If we gotta worry about shapes and values and edges, I certainly don't wanna get into the, the very deep well of color. Now, I'm suggesting to you, and it's the truth by virtue of that little um, sharing, that I'm not much of a colorist. Um, I love all painters, but they make me crazy when they ask what color are you using over and over and over again. Because what I say is, get the value right and the color won't matter. Get the value right. There was a newer painter in the workshop I taught last week. She wouldn't let it go. I said, tonight when you go to bed, I want you to start repeating to yourself, get the value right and the color doesn't matter. I really mean it. For the next week, every night, as you're trying to go to sleep, get the value right and the color doesn't matter. And that is so very true. Now, if we have some color sense, we can mix and apply beautiful colors and we know about some measure of color theory. We know that orange is a complement to blue and we know that green is a complement to red and we can put those colors together in our paintings and make it really stand out and sing. That's great. But color will not make the day. Color will not save the day. The best use of color in any painting will not save it if you have not focused on getting interesting shapes if you have not put together a value plan where you're drawing the viewer's eye to where you want them to look by using value contrast, and you do not use a variety of edges, color will not save the day. Shapes will, value will, edge variety will. You ever see a painting that's all hard edge? All of it can be the most glorious subject matter, can be painted beautifully, but it's all hard edge. I feel like I could take a pair of scissors and go in and cut anything I want out and remove it. I never want that to be the case. I want any painting that I um, work on and finish to be such that it all belongs together, that it's a unified piece that I can travel through the painting, um, crossing different areas of shape through soft edges without hitting something and being stopped. That's always the goal. That's another high, high watermark, but it can be done, I think. Make sense? Yes. Happy? Yes. Scared? Yeah. It's dark in here. If I hear a snore, that's a very bad sign. Very bad sign. Okay, so let's start painting. Um, first thing, I think, in this painting is to do the sky. Simple sky. It's not a painting about the sky, so I don't want to get hung up in trying to make a beautiful sky with um, clouds and, and all sorts of, um, if it was a painting about the sky, it probably wouldn't include a lighthouse. Simple purpley gray sky, try and get some uh, amount of texture in it and leave some white unpainted area of the paper while I'm at it. This is all gonna be dark, so I know that I can paint right over that. 
um, which is kind of helpful. So just do it. Nick, what paper are you using? I believe this is Arches 140 pound rough texture paper. And you always use rough? I do. Yes. So when I look at the photograph, um, it's got clouds and all sorts of movement in the sky. It's a pretty entertaining <laughs> sky. If I try and paint that, I know I'm going to fail miserably. So I don't want to be um, confused by the photograph. So I'm just going to set the phone down and not even look at the photograph. I think I've thought about this planned enough that I should be able to paint this without having to reference the photograph. That's the way I want to paint. I want to look at it and think about it, study it, plan, and then paint without the uh, burden of a photograph. Can't always do that, but that's where I want to try and be. Um, it's using artistic license, making decisions when painting that will make the painting better, not that will better follow the photograph. That's boring. I want to make a good painting, not a painting that necessarily looks like that photograph um, on my phone. So that if someone says, your painting reminds me of, you know, Bon Vivant Lighthouse in Scotland, hey, you betcha. That's just where it is. Um, I want it to be an exciting painting, not necessarily representative of um, Pimiquid Point, although that is the um, reference and the inspiration. Okay, so sky first, and we'll just we'll pick up and go from there. We'll go somewhere else from there. Stop talking and start painting. Sometimes just to get the uh, painting thinking about misbehaving, I will spritz it lightly with a misting spray bottle. This is the best piece of art equipment that I've purchased in years. It's a um, salon-style misting spray bottle. It costs $10 on Amazon. It's just great. If you're like me, you use um, eyeglass, you know, misting spray bottles once they are, are empty, but you're always in search of a nice misting spray bottle that makes a consistent, beautiful, thin, fine mist. I was getting my hair cut and the stylist reached for one of those and I said, hold on, stop right there. Where did you get that? She said, Amazon, look up um, stylus spray bottle. It's not only perfect, but it's also inexpensive. So if you're interested. And having a misting spray bottle, I think, is, is really important because as long as our watercolor painting is wet, we can do anything. It's only when it dries that we get into trouble, get hard edges, or we can't lift off or make adjustments, or we have to paint over a passage, which sometimes can lead to mud, especially if they're not two complementary colors. Um, so I like to keep it wet. Um, Joseph Zabukvich, the very well-known Australian watercolor painter, calls it the kiss of life. I love that. Water is the kiss of life. Keep your watercolor alive with a little bit of mist. OK, so purpley gray, a nice purple, purpley gray combination, I think, is cobalt blue and cobalt turquoise, and a little bit of brown matter. They play nicely together. Okay, here we go. Boom, we're off and running. That's dark. If it's too dark, what do we do? Exactly. A bunch of pros. Okay. Okay. Some rough texture. I have some hard texture. A little bit of soft texture might be nice. I don't want you to bleed down into. Let's see. Remember, this is not a painting about the sky, so don't make the sky more important than it is. Stop painting the sky now. 
Now would be a good time to stop painting the sky. Are you listening to yourself? Are you listening? Ooh. time to look over the sky while it's still wet. Look at that straight line here. That's as ugly a line as there could be. So what we do, we'll soften it. Ooh, I could do that. That suggests the wind coming off the ocean. Good idea. Glad I thought of that. Okay. That's enough of that. Sky done. Now what? What if we put in these trees that will help define the side of that lighthouse? Trees, and there's a, in the photograph, <clears throat> I know this, there is like a picket fence that runs along the bottom of the lighthouse and goes all the way off into the distance. I don't know if you can see that this guy, which is kind of a nice architectural feature. I think I'd like to try and put that in. It would be a nice way to break up the trees and the lightkeeper's house for that matter, <coughs> and to create some interesting texture here along the lighthouse. But I can't put it in until I start putting in the cast shadow on the lighthouse, so I can't do that yet. So let's do that first. Keeping an eye on this, hoping it doesn't misbehave too badly. <clears throat> okay. So I need to get some green. Green's a tough color, I think. Tough, tough color. For me, at least. Hard to get beautiful, exciting, engaging, entertaining greens. And we have so much green here where we live. If you don't love green, it's a problem. But what I was starting to say is I think I can suggest that picket fence without painting it. Just since the green is behind the fence, just use it as a foil and just drop in some nice pickets along the fence. A picket fence is perfection. Every picket's exactly the same size, same shape, same color down the line, which looks really beautiful on a Cape Cod home up in Massachusetts. Not so engaging and entertaining in a painting. Matter of fact, it's boring. So I want to have as much as possible some variety in my um, pickets. Some shorter, some taller, some thinner, some wider. And no better way to do that than to just stamp them in um, and not worry about their actual shapes or sizes. So let's get going. Maybe we'll start where we talked about, which is to put in that side of the lighthouse. So a green that I often use um, is Peril and Green by Windsor Newton. It's about the most attractive green that I have run across. It's very dark and rich, mixes well. Um, maybe a little bit of paint's great to darken it. A little bit of moly. And some quinacridone gold. They, they, they pay, play well together, I think. So, which, which green did you say you used? Peril and Green. Um, the spelling of which is P-E-R-Y-L-E-N-E, -E -E, I think. Okay, so here I am at the side of the lighthouse. Okay, now maybe I can take a smaller round brush and try and make it look a little bit more tree and brush like. Okay, I'm going behind the lighthouse. La -dee -da -dee -dee, la -dee -da -dee -dee -dee. Okay. 
careful. I said I wanted to put in that picket fence. Don't forget. I said I wanted to put in that picket fence. Don't forget. Okay, a little bit more of that. Rough texture. Would you like me to zoom in a little? Is that going to make it look better? <laughs> that's an important. That's an important question, John. Yes. If it's going to ruin it. But from an important person. <laughs> and Nick, that paper is dry or slightly damp? It's dry. It's dry. Okay, so I'm going to grab this brush here, and I'm going to continue. But I want to put that picket fence in. That's good. That's good. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to put in some of those picket fences. Different sizes, different shapes. Some taller, some smaller. Leading the viewer's eye into the center of interest, which is where? Don't scare me, it makes me think you're not paying attention. The lighthouse. Exactly. Okay. Very unimportant area of the painting, but. But it just made the lighthouse pop. What she said. Okay, let's do a little bit of this. Let's make that a little darker. Okay, we're off and running. Okay, then we have this light keeper's house coming out the other side. We've got a roof and a chimney and some other stuff going on. <clears throat> I want to leave some white on that, I think, as well. We can always go back and cover it up later, but the only time for us to leave that white is now. So let's not lose that opportunity. So. <clears throat> Ugh, it's green. Damn you, green. It gets in everywhere, too. Okay. I think I want this to be a little bit more leaning toward the, leaning toward the brown matter side of life. I have no idea what the actual color of the roof of that building is in the photograph, but I do know that I have green here, and I'm gonna have some green over here, so to drop a little bit of something warmer or closer to red in here is gonna make it sing, right? Because red is the complement to green. So, doesn't have to be red, red, just, there's all sorts of architectural stuff in here. Do what I said, and yeah, a little bit higher. A little bit higher. My least favorite way to paint. Paying attention to all the little intricacies. Mm -hmm. Tink, 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 tink. I'm going to try to have a big, broad brush with lots of water and a lot of pigment. But sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Okay, do that, do that, bring that down. Okay. Go 
Any questions about what we've talked about so far? you want to tell us about the brushes you use? Sure. We're all this is the, while you're doing the, uh, <laughs> the flat brushes are Winsor Newton um, Series 995. Um, I do not use expensive brushes if I can help it. These are relatively inexpensive synthetic brushes, but they work great and they take a beating. Um, so. I, I, if you use flat brushes, which you should, along with round brushes, I would highly recommend them. Okay, thank goodness that's done. <laughs> Let's take this quarter inch round brush. That might be nice. I have a lot of hard edges around here. <clears throat> a little bit of rough texture there, a little bit. It might be nice if I can get, um, see if it's possible, a little bit of rough texture up in this chimney. So I'm gonna, draw some of the moisture out of the brush by <coughs> tapping the ferrule against my paper towel and to see if I can make a fast brush stroke and just wham. Oh, that's nice. Oh. Rough texture. Variety of textural marks. <clears throat> that's actually an incredibly inaccurate brush mark, but it's got texture in it, and that makes it, to me, beautiful. Okay, I've also got this little roof down below here. Why don't we go ahead and put that in while we're here. We can leave red for the rest of that stuff. It comes over about here. Helping me tell the story of that lighthouse. Every stroke brings me closer to telling the story of Lighthouse. <clears throat> it almost looks like a lighthouse already. Yes, Mick, it does. <laughs> Working really hard up here. What a positive reinforcement. Never hurt anybody. Okay. We're all fascinating. Okay, <clears throat> go across. <sighs> okay, we got a little bit of rough texture there in that roof. I'm going to leave it for now. I can always go back and cover it up later, but I won't be able to recover it later, so let's leave it for now. Okay. Now let's pick up with the greens. I'm going to go up off the page here. This is closest to me. It gets um, farther away as it goes off here. So nice dark, rich value against the side of the building and then getting a little lighter in value as it fades away. And don't forget the picket fence. In fact, do yourself a favor, maybe do the picket fence up front. So you don't forget the picket fence comes off here. That's a break in the picket fence right there. Vandalism, I tell you. Maybe that just belongs there. Okay, now come back in with nice rich green. And I want it to get lighter in value out there, so don't get too carried away.
start on the right hand side there and come back. Start with something lighter in value. I'm way off in the distance. The green is not nearly as intense. Even throw a little bit of blue and brown in there. So it's slightly different color and value. And as it gets closer down again, it can get darker. Interesting shape. That needs to be an interesting shape. Interesting shape. Right now you are a boring shape. Holy moly. Okay. And help to find the edge of that building by doing that. Okay, nice. <clears throat> Maybe it would be a nice change of pace right after I do this. It goes in behind the lighthouse, really dark in value, should come out the other side, just that dark in value also. You can get lighter out there, but here it should be pretty like dark in value. Anyone use lavender when they paint? Yes. We love lavender. Why do we love lavender? Because wherever we put it, it does beautiful things. Use lavender. Maybe we just misting spray bottle a little bit and soften some of those edges so we have a nice variety of edges there. <clears throat> okay. Starting to zero in on our center of interest, which is the lighthouse and the light keepers house. Maybe we should put in the bottom of the lake keeper's house There's a couple of windows and doors and things that are also going to be the picket fence because it goes all the way across here. So, I <clears throat> don't think I want that to all be white, so. Maybe we'll just grab some of our purpley gray while we're here and just quiet this down some. Think about this. some of that brown matter from the roof to bleed down, which is nice. Connecting shapes. Connecting shapes, connecting shapes, connecting shapes. Even what are the greens coming over? Lucky me. Okay. And that creates a little bit of a border against that side of the lighthouse. Okay. <clears throat> it's all very exciting. Ooh, a bug. <laughs> I can see it. Came to visit. Okay. That's dry up there. So why don't we start painting in some of that? I want that to be really dark saying that all along. Really dark. But the 
the sunlight's coming from this direction, so it'd be nice if I could get it darker on this side and lighter on that side. Oof, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a tough, tough one to pull off, I think. Why would that green is bothering me? We have nice green, exciting stuff happening over here. This is all boring stuff. Oh well. Okay, so I need something dark, really dark. Maybe a Payne's gray with a little bit of, or a neutral tint with a little bit of burnt sienna. I think that'd be a nice dark. Not quite black, be black with a little bit of hue to it, something warm. But I think that. Visually, it will appear black. Okay, where should I put this? Okay. <laughs> Stay awake out there. Okay. <laughs> that was a good idea. Let's see if it will work. Neutral tint. A little bit of burnt sienna. That's going to be really dark, but hopefully we'll have a little bit more life than just. But you never use black. Neutral tint is black. Okay. It's 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 a it's a more beautiful black, I think. Boom. Where should I be looking? Look here. Where? Here. Pay attention to what's going on here. You can't see the spot. Okay. Can you zoom out just a bit so you, you can't see the top? top? Say that again. Is my I was head in the way? asking John to zoom out a bit so, so we can see the top. Ah, oh, okay. And I'll wait while we do that. I'm sorry. Thank you no for that. No problem. Thanks, John. Huh? Thank, you. Thank you. OK, right. so that's, that's really dark over here. And I'm just taking a damp brush and see if we can just get it to bleed over and create the illusion of sunlight as much as that is possible coming from the left hand side by just much more water and far less pigment. Where's the sunlight coming from? It's coming from left. over there. Even that least little bit helps me tell my story. And then I have this little round shape on top of the lighthouse mm -hmm. and a couple of little hoo-hahs and doodads up there to connect to the sky, a little bit of visual language. Okay, now what I'd like to do is bring it down here because we're standing on the ground, we're looking up. Our perspective tells us that, so I need to be able to look under the dome of the lighthouse. What color is that? I'm adding a little bit of lavender in here. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm just going to try and draw, if I can, draw a little bit of that color from the dome down. And then later, when this is drier, we can even try and drop the, the light in there. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I'm looking up, I'm looking through. Yeah, fair enough. Now I have this. That thingy. Um, so you get to take this three quarter inch. I didn't make that very straight. 
neutral tint, a little bit of burnt sienna. See if I can do the same thing again. <clears throat> Don't yell at John, this is me doing this. And see if we can draw that across. And the same idea, I want to try to, if I can, lighten the value some over here, if I can. Okay, sunlight coming from that direction. And then we have this down here, same thing, if I can. And those two shapes can be connected. damp brush, see if we can just create the illusion of coming over into the sunlight over on this side. Okay. So far so good. Now, the rubber has to hit the road this time. I gotta bring the cast shadow down across the lighthouse. <clears throat> Sunlight coming from this direction, shadow on this side, mm -hmm. gradually transitioning to sunlight on that side. Um, let's stick with this brush, stick with this. Do you need clean water, Nick? Um, probably, but I don't want it, I don't want it. Thank you, Margie. All the colors in there are the colors that are on here, okay. so they should all belong. So blue, Turquoise, let's see that. A little bit of matter. That's going to make that nice gray color. <clears throat> maybe some ultramarine since we haven't used it at all. And maybe some of that burnt sienna again. I just want something nice and rich that I can <clears throat> draw across here and begin to tell the story of the sunlight. So. That's rich, all right. <clears throat> Don't get carried mm -hmm. away, sir. <coughs> and then the far edge of. I'd like to drop some. It's going to be rusting things on this. Old, weathered lighthouse. I'm going to drop some of that in. Okay, keep going. Rest on your laurels, keep going, keep going, keep going, all the way down. <clears throat> okay. Got that down to there. <clears throat> now I want to take some fresh water if I can, and while it's still wet, see if we can get, create the illusion of the transition from bright sunlight over on this side to the cast shadow on the other side.
Not too bad. Not too good. Not too bad. I'll take my paper towel, use it. And again, I'm going to grab some of that if I can. Some of that burnt sienna, drop that in. See if we can create some of that. Bust like effect if we can. And maybe a little bit of that burnt sienna from the bottom, <clears throat> which would represent light bounce, light coming up from the ground. Okay. As long as this is wet, I can keep working at it. It's only when it dries that I run out of opportunity. And if I get some rough texture over here, it's not the worst thing, at least not from my perspective, because the lighthouse is not going to be smooth. It's going to be textured. All right, let's let that sit for a bit. And <clears throat> I need to get those Pickets in. So what color is it going to be behind the pickets at the lighthouse? It's going to be the colors of the cast shadow on the lighthouse. That's blue and green and red and blue again. Let's see how that looks. I want to leave this area unpainted at the moment. Because that's coming out into the sunlight. And maybe we don't have pickets visible there at all. Nice texture happening up here. Scary right now because all this stuff is not looking particularly painterly, <clears throat> excuse me, to me. But I like that texture. It's an old weathered lighthouse. That texture works. It's believable to me. Okay, keep going. Maybe we'll try and lift this little window here out a little bit. Drop windows in there later. We'll just lift it out a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now where are we? Now what? We can put a couple of cast shadows in here in the lightkeeper's house. Let's take this quarter inch brush and there would probably be a cast shadow off of this eave. It would look something like that. and a cast shadow off of this eave up here that would look something like that. Trying to reinforce that story of where our sunlight is coming from. And there'd be a cast shadow off of the rooftop here. that. 
we can put some windows in there and some doors and things in a little bit. <clears throat> Now I have all of this to do something with, all of this foreground area. Let's put these rocks in first. A good rock technique that I have used for a long time is to put really thick, rich pigment on in the shape of a rock, and then use an old beat up credit card to scrape the rock shapes out. It's not the only way to do rocks, but it is a fun way to do them, an easy way to do them, and they look pretty darn rock-like, I think. Especially on rough paper. Rough texture paper helps with everything. Okay, so I'm gonna take this flat brush and what colors will I use? As many colors as I can. Ultramarine, cobalt blue, cobalt turquoise, burnt umber, raw umber, brown matter, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue again, about $15 worth of pigment on my brush and just make the shape of a rock. The idea being that with all these colors, optically, it looks close to black, but the reality is it's all of these colors in combination. So that when I get to scraping out with the credit card, those colors should come back to me. Okay, so there's a rock. I need to be patient to let the pigment seep into the fibers of the paper, but before it's dry, scrape out the layer of pigment on top. So again, blue, green, brown, another kind of brown. Just the shape of rocks. That's two. And three. For the painter who loves to rant about the importance of connecting shapes, I'm not connecting these shapes at all. Because I'm hoping to use the grass that we'll put in to connect all those shapes. We'll have that rock go right off the page. Okay, slightly different sizes, slightly different shapes, each representing a rock shape. Looking at it from the side, they should be about ready for, about ready for scraping out. So I'm gonna grab my credit card here. What, what do rocks look like? Generally, they're not square, not really rectangular. They're not much in the way of circular, but kind of oval in shape. So we'll just try and scrape out the shape of a rock. And there's the raw umber, the cobalt violet, the burnt sienna. All those colors are coming back to me in those rocks, making that shape much more interesting and engaging than it would be if I just painted it with those pigments. Same thing is here. Okay, and then one more time. A lot of blue in this rock. And the rough texture that I've gotten down below kind of marries them to the ground that they're sitting on, connects them to that ground. I can do all sorts of things if I want to. I can grab some boutique -y colors, um, like the lavender, 
like the Jean Briand, and just drop them in and let them do their thing. It could create the illusion of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not fungus. What's that word? Moss. You always have moss on the rocks. Exactly. Just to make them a little bit more interesting to look at. Not critically important, but I could do it, therefore I did do it. Okay, now I want to put in some grass. I don't want to cover all of this because I said that in a vignette format. Um, one of the goals is to leave as much white, unpainted paper as possible possible, but I want to get really, really aggressive with my splattering. I want to splatter with a small little round brush. I want to splatter with a big moppy brush to make as much of um, an exciting <coughs> look as I can. If I put this sheet here, what's behind it is mostly dry. I'll lay it down and then we'll just splatter for a while. Let's have some splattering fun. Big mop brush, same greens I was mixing earlier. Make sure I have my old Who Cares jeans on and just start splattering. drop some water in. This is my kind of painting. Now we're having painting fun. I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, you said this, this is my kind of painting. Oh, the way I'm actually painting. Big, oh, okay. big, bold brush strokes with little regard for staying in the lines, for lack of a better way to put it. Lift this up, see where we are. That is such, so much more fun than actually trying to stay in the lines when painting. I'd like this to be, if I can, soften that some. There was the number two finger pencil. Do some of that. Do some of that. Excuse me. I need to get darker. There's a lot of water in here, and we know that watercolor is going to dry lighter. So paint it dark now. Now's the time to make it dark. Okay. Not on the lighthouse, though. Nobody told you to do that. Okay. Maybe we'll bring it all the way up along there. do when we're at that point is cast some shadows off of the lighthouse and maybe off of the lake keeper's house so I don't have to worry too much about this area over here being all that interesting at this point.
Okay. Gotta lift some of that green off of the rocks. Lots of unpainted green area. Okay, any questions about where we are and kind of how we got here? It's very quiet out there. We're in awe. We're fascinated. Okay, what we should do is probably break that green up a little bit with something. Um, like lavender. We have lavender users with us today, Not so yet. you better be. You're missing the boat. Next time. Put some lavender. Lavender does beautiful things. Um, in, a, in a landscape, it can represent so many things without having to paint anything. And then we can also add in some Jean Riant, which is a warm, opaque, white kind of pigment, where lavender will um, tend to blend in and dissolve into the pigment around it. And what kind of white is that? Okay. It's called Jean Brion, um, oh. J-A-U-N-E, brilliant number, number one. Um, it's by Holbein, just a warm, opaque white, does beautiful things wherever you put it. It's uh, very, very useful boutique color. Okay, so here we are. Probably need a couple more. I should have brought a hair dryer, but I didn't, so we'll have to deal with it as it is. Okay, so lots of areas of unpainted white. Yes. Can you move the painting towards you a little bit? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Let me get it lined up again. How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a little more architectural work up there. A little bit of architectural work in our lake keeper's house. A little bit of work behind that fence there. We got the flag here. We want to put that flag in. But most of the hard work here, I think, is done. Um, is there, by any chance, a hair dryer in the house? Sometimes we're in the crack. Because it's really wet. A little bit of drying might help. You know what we can do while we wait? Let's put the flag in. Um, and Margie offered to get some fresh water earlier. Would you mind doing that? That would be Not great. at all. It's really, really green and mucky. It is. It looks like pieces.
three thirty. I gotta get done. That's kind of short. But no, thank you, John. That's that's perfect. starting to crack. Okay, we got to get done. It's 3:30. We're running out of time. Um, let's let's go ahead and put some windows and things in real quick, just to kind of accentuate some things. So window right there. I don't think it's in the photograph that way, but I think it needs a window there, so we're putting one in. Nice. Fast, rough texture brush mark, right about. Is it a flat brush? It is a flat brush. Flat. Right about there. Perfect. That wasn't a good brush stroke. That was a perfect brush stroke. <laughs> Let's put these windows in here. One, two. These rough texture brush marks say everything without painting anything. That's amazing. It's light coming through those windows. <clears throat> it's curtains on the windows. It almost doesn't matter. It's just wow. that, to me, is the right way to paint. Those couple of windows in there. Make that window jump out a little bit. We got these. Okay. And then back behind there, there are doors and windows and stuff. Lightkeeper's house stuff. See if we can figure out how to just really quickly render that. Um, which will also help us to. That's really dark. Maybe not quite that dark. Down on top of these. Just make this whole area a little bit more interesting. Okay, that's that. And then over here, there's two windows. We can put those in. <clears throat> Even better. And let's see. 
again, trying to draw as much moisture as I can out of the brush and just make simple, fast, rough texture brush marks to say, window, window. Okay, and maybe bring that down a little bit in here. Connect those window shapes with what's behind them. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, you, <clears throat> what am I gonna do with you? Now what? Fence up top. What's that? Fence up top. Yeah, like the railing around, yep. Yeah, the railing at the top. That's scary stuff. I don't like heights. <laughs> okay, let's... I'm gonna try and make some of these marks with the credit card, I think, just because it'll make it easier. And I'm all about easy. Let's see if we can. There's one. And like that. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be believable. And there's a mark. There's a mark. And there's a mark. I don't want to get too hung up in painting them. Maybe put a couple of them back here in the distance like they're going back around the back of the Okay, we should do the same thing up here. Like that. <clears throat> so much detail up here. I do not want to be in the business of having to try and paint it all. Just want to suggest as much of it as I can. And don't worry about getting it perfectly correct. There's one back there, and one back there, and one back there, and one back there. Just suggest that stuff. Okay, a couple of railing, <clears throat> a couple of railings. I'm gonna grab my scary sword rigger brush. This guy, which carries a lot of pigment and a lot of water, it's a scary brush. Oh, that's a long brush. <laughs> that's a scary brush right there. Um, Is that a rosemary? No, it's pro, pro art. They're from England. A series, it's a set of three of them rather, that are like kind of $25, but they make beautiful um, rigor marks. They just carry a lot of pigment and a lot of water and can be rather unwieldy. So let's say this, this one comes across like this, and across like that. Keep it simple, keep it simple. Keep it simple, less is more, especially when it comes to detail. Keep it simple. Okay, and you. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. <clears throat> oh, we didn't put in the uh, the, flag? the light. Well, we'll put the flag in too. Oh, yeah, the light. Don't push me. Don't push me. <laughs> Just a couple more, a couple more simple things. Um, the light. Let's get a round brush. And what color would the light be? Let's try the Jean Brion. Let's see. What color are you using? Jean Brion. It's the uh, Warm white. It's a warm white pigment. Uh -huh. Really don't need to do any more than that, but if we moisten our brush and just soften the edges a little bit, it almost looks like the light's on. Okay, we'll let that be. I want to get really scary. And Let's put the flag in first. Really, really, really simply. Do not want to get all hung up in trying to paint. 
the 13 stars and the stripes. how many stripes? 13 stripes and 50 stars, like I said. Simple, 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 simple. Excuse me. And look at that, that rough texture brush mark. Put all those Whites. stars in for me. Lucky me. Now to grab my rigger brush again, go directly into this high roll red, which is one powerful red. And I just want to put in a couple of those red stripes. That's enough. Okay. Now, there's no flagpole. Should I put one in? The suggestion. Say it with me. <laughs> no, no, it's so much more painterly, I think, just leave the flag there. We know there's a flagpole, right? It's all in the meat. That creates a partnership between me and the viewer. The viewer says, and every time I put in a flag in a painting, if it's with a group of people, I'll say, where's the flagpole? It only reinforces with me. I'm not putting it in. It just reinforces. Okay, a couple, couple of real quick things. I want to... I want to get some something gray, and I think it would be nice if I could, <clears throat> to, since I'm saying the sunlight's coming from this direction, if I could get just a couple of these fence posts to be casting a shadow, it would be nice. Not all of them, just some of them. And then maybe these fence posts that I can't see in here, they still cast a shadow, which tells the viewer what? That they're there without me painting them on. That's painterly stuff, folks. Just between us chickens. And here. It further solidifies the base of the lighthouse, too. Exactly. Kind of marries the lighthouse, too. And I don't need to do much more of this. Now one more, maybe two more bold strokes. The first one is I want to cast a shadow from the lighthouse across that lawn. That's a little scary to be honest, but I can't help myself. So blue, blue, a little bit of green. Don't want it to be too dark. I want to try and get, if I can, a little bit of rough texture. Sunlight is coming from this direction, casting a shadow across this way. How many chances do I get to get this right? Just one. Connecting shapes, right? We're connecting the shapes of the lighthouse to the lawn. Not to the rock, though. It's behind the rock. And then it's a scary prospect, but what about the lightkeeper's house? And wait. There's the flagpole. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha, all you non-believers. Okay. And then I think we call it done. Right? Yeah. What do you think? Thank you. That was fun. I am astounded how looking at that you see the side of the lighthouse in your lace. Now that lovely piece of art can go home with you. Buy some raffle tickets. We're selling them in the back.
Guys, also be aware we have the mail.